it's going and here we are welcome to pack west bigfoot you guys um this is david and uh from the land of plaiting coffee i have a awesome special guest it is ken gerhard this guy is the one of this these those top cryptozoologists out here um as a matter of fact i wanted to spend some time today um first i'm gonna ask him a little bit about some of his favorite um I guess we say favorite field time events. And of course, we're going to dive into a lot about his latest book out here. Matter of fact, I ordered mine. It's on the way. I can't wait to get it and read it. But until then, Ken, welcome to Pack West Bigfoot. Hey, David. Thank you so much for having me on. It's uh, absolutely a pleasure and also an honor to be here with you. So. Uh, thanks, man. You know, uh, here at Pack West Bigfoot, we do a lot of the entertainment side of stuff with Bigfoot and everything else. But when we, you know, I get to do the research I get to do is actually done through researchers like you, where I get to inter do interviews with some uh, great folks like yourself and, and others. And uh, real quick, I just want to have you kind of give me and us kind of a little bit of a background here of um, just kind of your, I guess, the the why behind cryptozoology for you. Um, like why I got into it? Yeah. Well, um, it's been a lifelong passion ever since I was, when I was a boy, I was already uh, in love with animals and monsters and cryptozoology kind of is a nice synthesis of both of those things. <laughs> um but uh, it's been a lifelong interest, and my mother was a huge influence. She used to tell me about the Mothman and the Yeti, and uh, I used to love TV shows like In Search Of and, you know, all those kind of old school mm -hmm. Bigfoot shows. And, um, but my family traveled quite a bit. My mother was a travel agent, and we had some pretty adventurous vacations when I was growing up. So, for example, we oh, camped wow. along the Amazon River and the Galapagos Islands and Australian Outback and... Um, by by age 15, I was at Loch Ness, and uh, I actually attempted field research there as a teenager with a movie camera, interviewing people and stuff. So um, I don't know. Uh, just been uh, interested in it, and I I've been very fortunate and blessed. I started writing books years ago and uh, got on some TV shows, and that opened some doors. And of course, I work with all of the other leading cryptozoologists around the world, and um, that's you know quite an honor. I mean, a lot of brilliant men that have shared their expertise. So um, what really got it, got me into it pretty much full time is um, probably about 20 years ago, I, I met through the internet, I met some, uh, some Bigfoot researchers in Texas that were pretty hardcore and they started taking me out in the field and I began to experience things I couldn't explain and that kind of intensified. So uh, mm -hmm. I've never had a sighting. People ask me that, but I've, I've, fairly convinced I've heard Bigfoot vocalizations on a few occasions through the years. So mm -hmm. I've, I've heard some vocalizations I couldn't explain, but, uh, and seen other evidence, but never, uh, never had a visual sighting of one of these things, anything that okay. I investigate. So. Uh, so on, on some of those, uh, <clears throat> vocalizations, um, can you let us know a little bit about where you were at and some of the research you were doing at that time? Yeah. The most dramatic ones I recorded on August 18th, 2003, Three, mm. 2003, 2005, I'm not remembering exactly which year, but uh, we were at a location. I was with three other investigators. We were at a place called Cottonwood Lake, which is in North Texas near the Oklahoma border. There had been apparently a lot of sightings and activity in this area, and it was very remote. And um, just after dark, we started hearing these. Uh, we were actually hiking around the lake, and we heard these grunting noises, and it sounded just like an ape. It was a primate-type sound, mm. but very very powerful and loud and it just stopped us in our tracks and we were kind of dropping f-bombs and um i had <laughs> i record i recorded the sounds um so it was kind of like a deep heavy panting it almost sounded like deep laughter or panting but it was you know it was a grunt mm -hmm. and uh, we could we couldn't see what was making it because it was about 40 yards away in some very thick brush but we tried to to flush it out to our credit didn't do that we did see some eye shine later that night, shining spotlights in this approximate area. And in the following morning, we found uh, corroborating evidence, footprints. We, we finally made our way through the brush where we'd heard this thing. We found some mutilated animal carcasses and, and footprints and things. So that was fairly convincing. I've also heard the, the so-called whoops. Uh, I've heard those on mm -hmm. several occasions in active locations, very primate-like. And it, they seem to be more prevalent around dusk. Um, 
I've heard a uh, kind of a moaning sound that was very deep and very reminiscent of other moans that have been described by other Bigfoot researchers. Um, and I, I can't say conclusively, but I've heard whistling noises, almost bird-like calls. And uh, the investigators that were familiar with that area were convinced that that was actually Bigfoot trying to mimic a bird, that it wasn't a bird. But of mm -hmm. course, that's it's all speculation. We didn't see what was making the noise. So. <laughs> Uh, I may have heard bipedal footsteps on one location too, and uh, it was very close by, very loud, but uh, I wasn't able to to position myself where I could see what was making it, but it definitely sounded like big bipedal footfalls. Uh, so that's, you know, mm -hmm. that, that's after many, many years of uh, of research. I've had those, just those few occasions where I've heard things I couldn't explain. Oh, wow. And uh, <clears throat> what is, uh, I guess I would say, what is, uh, where is, um, Maybe one of your very favorite places to do a, a little bit of what do they call squatching? Um, are we talk? Are we limiting it to the um, anywhere United North America? Anywhere? Anywhere? Okay. Your favorite? Ken's favorite? Well, um, Alaska, of course, was a pretty pretty unbelievable experience. I spent months up there in 2015, and uh, mm -hmm. that's uh, the potential there is just mind blowing because you're talking about 600,000 square miles of just pristine wilderness i mean just mm. ample food source coverage everything that something like bigfoot or sasquatch would actually need so um but i'm a jungle guy also and i've actually investigated a sasquatch type creature in central america known as the sisamito mm -hmm. and uh, there are sightings in southern belize honduras guatemala in the mountains and the descriptions are similar to bigfoot they say they're about six or seven feet tall walk upright you know very they call them like mountain gorillas but they say they walk upright very big and powerful mm -hmm. and um so you know that's much like uh, a skunk ape i guess you would yeah say. yeah something like that but mm -hmm. i mean the, according to the the, the kachki maya people that live in the areas where these things are, are said to, they live in the high mountains and they only come down occasionally from those altitudes there is there are some mountain ranges in uh, central america uh, that actually extend into Mexico and, and eventually here in the, in the United States. So mm -hmm. uh, it's kind of a, con what I guess I'm getting at is it's a contiguous thing. So, I mean, if you, you could speculate that if Bigfoot and it, uh, is prevalent in the Rocky Mountains, then it's also prevalent in the Sierra Madres and then down into the, yeah. the Central American mountain ranges as well. So, um, uh, but I like a lot of those areas as well down in Central America. Oh, nice. Now I, you know, I'm really, kind of big on the science side of it um, myself. Um, I know a lot of folks <clears throat> in that camp um, look at there being, you know, multiple varieties of Bigfoot, you know, four mm. or five, seven different species. Me, I kind of fall along just two, you know, a Northern hemisphere and a Southern hemisphere, mm. you know, this, this bigger one in the, you know, in the Northern hemisphere where, you know, much of the year it's, it's, rather cold <laughs> Bergman's, Bergman's rule <clears throat> yeah <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah so for me it was like that kind of Occam's razor kind of a thing you know and then the southern half where it's usually tends to be you know much warmer climate and everything else you get that taller thinner um a little less hairy kind of uh, uh a Bigfoot and so I, I'm how do you how do you feel about that what do you think well, it's interesting. Zoologist. <laughs> you int it's interesting you brought this up because I, I just did a lecture recently where I discussed the, the taxonomy of Bigfoot. Because you're right, nice. different researchers have speculated two, three, four, five, uh, even up to nine different subspecies. Yeah. And you do have subspeciation within any species. And of course, mm -hmm. when, you go to, when an animal radiates into different habitats, there, there are changes that can occur. Um, uh, it's interesting you brought it up because I, I have a chapter in my new Bigfoot book is dedicated to a pygmy sized thing that I call Littlefoot. And uh, in my investigations around North mm -hmm. America, I've uh, found, a, you know, a lot of eyewitness accounts that describe a race of little three to five foot tall Bigfoot type creatures. And I don't, I, I mean, I'm absolutely would be a subspecies. Now, some people have said, well, those could be juvenile Sasquatches. Some could be because Bigfoot's not born seven feet tall. We, we know that. But, um, you know, these are, these are long-standing traditions, native traditions of entire races of these little proto-pygmies. I call them proto-pygmies because that's what uh, mm -hmm. 
Mm -hmm. Ivan T. Sanderson, one of the founding fathers of cryptozoology, called these little proto-pygmies. And if you look around the world, you have examples such as the Orang Pendek or Sumat of Sumatra. Yeah. Uh, in Africa, they're known as the Agagwe, the Sahite, the Tokolosh. In Asia, many of the Yeti descriptions are of little tiny creatures. Um, and then here in America, you have things in South America like the Shiru and Didi. But in Central America, I've investigated something known as the Duende. Mm -hmm. And uh, even all the way up into Alaska, creatures known as the uh, Anukins or Jinxiox. Uh, there are many Native American traditions of the little people. And they're described as little hair-covered Sasquatches, but they're only about three to five feet tall. So I, you know, I'm kind of speculating. Mm -hmm. It's all speculation, right, David? That, yeah. there could be a, that there could be some pygmy-sized version, and I don't know if it would be an actual subspecies or a completely different species, something like Homo floresiensis or Homo habilis or one of these ancient pygmy hominids that inhabited the planet. Mm. Oh, nice. So, yeah. um, but, you know, there are definitely mm. different types based on the, the eyewitness <laughs> descriptions. Yeah. In different areas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so recently... <clears throat> you've written a book, a new book, and I can't wait to get my copy. Uh, I keep checking my mail every day. <laughs> so I'm looking, um, I'm looking at the list right now to see, uh, yeah, you're on there. I'm getting to you, David. The, the, books, <laughs> the books are in and it's been like a warehouse here in my, in my home here for the last couple of days as I'm trying oh, to ship bet, all these man. out. So I'm getting uh, there. I keep telling everybody, it's like, you know, I started my, uh, um, I've been working from home for like 10 years now doing internet marketing, things like that for people and doing drop shipping stuff and helping people do that. And it is, it can be, um, it, it can, <laughs> it can be pretty crazy. Yeah. <laughs> so I got a, I got a, a couple back in Connecticut. I helped them put their, their business together and all this stuff. And it was just, it was nuts, but they did about a little over a million dollars in sales last year. So it was pretty good. So, wow. That's awesome. Yeah, it was pretty fun. But man, it, it, they asked me why I don't do it. And I said, well, no, <laughs> I don't want the headache. Uh, so there you go. But um, yeah, I'm looking forward to that. Could you tell us a little bit or a whole lot if you wish, whatever you want, uh, about the new book, <laughs> uh, the reason uh, you wrote it and uh, give us some, uh, some, um, uh, just some idea into, you know, why you wrote it, um, what you're, you know, what it's about. Yeah. Um, the book is called the essential guide to Bigfoot. And the reason I decided to write it was that I found that as we are entering kind of the, the crux of the information age, as I call it, you know, there's so much information that people are bombarded with these days via, you know, YouTube and, Instagram, Facebook, wherever, podcasts and links and articles. Um, but there's really nobody kind of fact checking a lot of that information. So there's a lot of misinformation, falsehoods and misperceptions, particularly with regard to the Bigfoot or Sasquatch. Uh, people will read articles or watch videos that are, that are just not based on um, the foundational evidence that we have. And I, I guess mm. a lot of people don't realize that Bigfoot research has been going on for at least 60 years and, you know, even beyond. And uh, there are a number of people that spent, investigators that spent decades collecting evidence and data and, and critically thinking and analyzing. And I think those are the people whose opinions matter. You know, the people that yeah. put the time and the work in and really thought about this, you know, academically. And, and so anyways, um, so what I'm trying to do is kind of push back against a lot of the misinformation and provide um, kind of concise, um, accurate fact check things with regard to Bigfoot's physical characteristics, its behavior patterns, its uh, the history of all the, the research that's been done, the evidence that's been collected. And um, just, you know, for people that are interested in Bigfoot, but, you know, kind of want a, a, a concise summary of all the important aspects of the phenomenon, you know? Mm -hmm. And um, so it's kind of for the, for the beginner, uh, but it's also, I think most experienced Bigfoot people will also find some, some new information there because I did some very in-depth research. Well, actually I've been doing it for, for decades and I've had the great honor of working with most of the top Bigfoot investigators in the world mm -hmm. and pick, picking their brains on a regular basis. And um yeah, so uh, there it is, and uh, it's, uh, it's uh, I think it's a, a technical read at times, but other times not so much, so it kind of 
you know, vacillates, but you have to be technical because, you know, we were talking about science earlier. I mean, that's, you know, one of the aspects of Bigfoot that's being sorely overlooked is there, there is some science behind it in terms of what we know about, you know, the, the physical characteristics, why those make sense, the behaviors mm -hmm. that are described by eyewitnesses and why those all kind of add up and, and, and add supporting evidence. And um, so, yeah, uh, the essential guide to Bigfoot and uh, it's available on Amazon. It, uh, and I'm just starting to mail out the first, very first shipment here that I got in. Yesterday. Oh, nice. Nice. I'm so looking forward to that. Um, <clears throat> I actually had a friend, he actually works for the forest service and uh, he had sent me uh, or gave me a, a, a copy of one of these. Uh, it's not too old. Um, Sasquatch Seekers Field Manual or something like that. Mm. It's a fun little read, but you know, it doesn't, I don't think it's really coming from somebody who, you know what I mean? Who's really been out there doing yeah. a lot of that research and field, field work. Yeah. Yeah. For me, when I, you know, I don't really get out to do that kind of thing. I work at home, but I got, you know, five kids and married and everything. Sure. Else. So yeah. it's like, ah, mm. so <laughs> the only thing I could do with Bigfoot was to turn your, you know, your, you know, reports into campfire stories. And so uh, for me, I just wanted to get out here and, and kind of entertain people when they couldn't be out in the field and when they couldn't get out and do things. And so, yeah, it can be very time yeah. consuming. Um, and yeah. certainly um, I know Bigfoot researchers, investigators, men and women who've, you know, uh, had issues with their spouses and things. Because they, they, <laughs> it becomes an obsession. I mean, it really does when you, uh, you know, when you get hooked by this thing, but, um, uh, you know, the, I, there is an old saying in the Bigfoot field, which is your, your very worst day of field research is a nice day in the woods. So, I mean, that's kind of the, the good yeah. side. The bright yeah. side is that, you know, even if you don't find anything, which you typically don't, um, you're, you know, you're out in the outdoors and you can just kind of get to soak that in. So. Yeah. You're just kind of enjoying the time. I mean, when we do go camping though, in the summer and things like that, you know, the family camp out and everything, we do go kind of tromping around <laughs> in the yes. woods. and we listen closely at night. Sometimes we'll sit there and lay awake, read a book, sit by the fire and just kind of listen. Yeah. Know, Cause you never know. Um, and I know a lot of people wanted me to start sharing my story and everything, but I figured I'd wait till this interview and kind of um, actually share with you because you might have some, I don't know, maybe some, some um, advice or some sort of, uh, you know, in-depth look at it. But I had um, my experience. I didn't see anything either, man. Um, but I heard and I heard it right outside the tent mm -hmm. and then I heard it walk off. Now here's the deal though. About 20 years before that and about two, three miles away or something, me and my mom found tracks in the snow. Oh, wow. Okay. So we found these tracks that came out of this wood line <clears throat> down over this little open area, down the side of a little old logging road, down to a creek, and then shot straight back up into that same dense forest area, that tree line. But it traveled down. I mean, if we were smart enough back then, um, I would say that we had, there must have been uh, probably the longest track set ever. It was, it was, it was long. Mm -hmm. it, it went from halfway up where we were, were, and it went down to the creek and then it shot back up. And, uh, then about 20 years later, I was out and we decided me and a friend of mine, his wife and his kid, we were just kind of goofing around for a couple nights up there. And we were like, Hey, let's go gold panning. Who knows? <laughs> so we were like, Oh, I'm like, okay, whatever. So we were up there kind of messing around and uh, the little one woke up and screamed. I mean, just all out blood curdling scream from a two year old in the middle of the night in the woods. Mm -hmm. And the next thing you know, it was just that thud, thud, splash, thud. And that Creek that it hit had to be, 10, 11, maybe 12 feet wide at the wow. time, even in July mm -hmm. in Oregon, you still have some good amount of Creek going on in the early part of July. And that, uh, it just, it went thud, thud, and you could feel it cause we were on kind of some dirt there, but at the same time, there's a lot of that river rocks, you know, that's around there. Right. And so it's that smoothed out stone stuff. 
and it just went thud, thud, splash, thud. And then it went crashing up this mountain in front of us, this big old hill or mountain or whatever in front of us, just crashing through it. But that thing was bipedal. Mm. And what's freaky though, is that right before she screamed, uh, his wife kind of had come to a little bit for some reason. And she, 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 this is what she heard behind our heads. Just this intake of like sniffing through a big, huge nostril. Wow. And then all of a sudden the little one screamed and that thing went thud, thud, splash, thud. And then starts crashing up through that. My buddy pulled out of the tent real quick and I went right behind him. And all of a sudden dead silent, no movement. No, nothing, no noise, nothing for the rest of the evening that night. Hmm. And so we all climbed into the truck and locked the doors. Wow, that's pretty unnerving. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. I mean, you could tell this thing sounds like you, you knew it was pretty huge if it was, you know, the, the sound of its footfalls <laughs> and the, just the, you know, the, when it inhaled. Um, I've never. Yeah. I've never heard anything like that or felt it because when it walked off, you know, like when you're sitting there on a floor in your kitchen and it's like linoleum or whatever, and you beat on, you know, you thump your your fist on one side of it and you're, you know, somebody else has a hand on the other side of that room. You can still feel that vibration. Sure. You can yeah. hear it and feel it. It was like that. Hmm. And so it was, it was pretty intense. Well, thanks for sharing that, man. And, and what was the location again? That was yeah. actually, and I'll tell you, it is Elderberry Flats is what they call it. Up, Like, I think it's Elderberry Creek or something like that. It's kind of, um, I would say it's a little northeast of Gold Hill, Oregon, of Medford, Oregon, and all of that. Oh, okay. Yep. Gotcha. Yep, up out of the Rogue Valley there, and you just drive up in there. We were actually, uh, the time that we were uh, saw the footprints in the snow, um that was christmas and uh, i'm trying to remember what year it was you know 1985 1986 um, i don't know something like that i was i was about 13 years old right um you know i was just uh, you know i might have been 14 i think it was heading in yeah i think i was 14 i was a freshman that year in high school and or it was i uh, something like that and um yeah that's that's when we saw the treks but i remember that day <laughs> mm. And my mom wants up around Hyatt Lake, Oregon, um, her and some other campers actually heard some really crazy screaming and hollering one night when I was a kid and we were, we were uh, camping up there. So, wow. you know, for me, like you, I, I didn't see anything, but you just, you just know in your gut that it was nothing that's in some sort of, you know, wild fauna of Pacific Northwest book mm. you know it was something they didn't include yeah gotcha yeah so um yeah thanks for sharing that so here are some relevant things that if you had the uh my new book the essential guide to bigfoot uh you would be able to for example know that the average sized bigfoot footprint and this is based on you know hundreds and hundreds of measurements and documentations is about 15 and a half inches long and seven mm. and a half 7.2 inches wide the sasquatch foot of course okay. is very it looks superficially human-like but um and the average stride of a sasquatch is 50 inches uh although there have been when they're moving fast i guess that's been documented over 100 inches but that's still a pretty big someone should go out there and try to take a stride 50 inches and he'd be well, I'll pretty tell much you doing the splits. So, and yeah. I'll tell you what, this matches that because here's the thing. When I, I, I actually put my foot in them <laughs> mm -hmm. and um, it was, it was tw you know, two, two and a half, three times the size of my foot because I was 13 at the time and I'm not sure. a very big guy. Um, you know, I may be a little fat, but I ain't big. <laughs> and I'll tell you what, back then I was a skinny little guy, but it was like, you know, three times my size of my foot. And when I went from and stretched from one to the other, I could only hit like the front pad of my foot would go over the back part of the heel mm. of the next footprint. And that was yeah. with almost a full stretch. Yeah. So they you know, sound splits. 
So oh, huge. yeah, so that that's pretty typical. Uh, the other thing, and hopefully this won't ruin it for the the people that do enjoy that kind of the campfire aspect of the the Bigfoot stories, but um, I'm firmly convinced, and I write about this in the book, that Bigfoot is essentially more afraid of us than we are of it. Mm-hmm. That that it has adapted avoidance behaviors specifically geared to stay away from humans. That's why we haven't mm-hmm. been able to find them because they're intelligent enough. Um, and, you know, but they're also the other dynamic is that, you know, they're also curious and uh, they're also territorial like any animal. So if you're in its turf, it's territory. And that's why you hear the accounts of the stone throwing, you know, stones flying at people out of the woods or yeah. the, the vocalizations, which can be very scary. I mean, they, they definitely feel threatened by us, I think. And, and, and they're going to try to scare people. But very, very few accounts, uh, almost virtually no accounts of anyone being killed or maimed or you know you know in the scheme of things so Mm -hmm. it 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 is an instinct that you would be afraid of something that's that huge and and particularly since you don't know what it is i mean it's an unknown so that's natural for you to be terrified in that situation or anyone that feels that they're in the proximity of a bigfoot but uh i you know i just i don't think that these things are actually abducting killing harming people and so in that respect, if anyone does get in that situation, just try to keep that in mind that it's curious and it's probably, you know, okay. afraid of you. So. Well, I do have one thing and uh, I will mention this cause I'm going to be doing an interview with, um, um, a gentleman next week. Um, his wife, uh, they were all camping and it was outside camping. I mean, literally no tent, no nothing. And this was back in like the eighties. Um, she woke up out of a dead sleep and for, you know, one of those sleeps where something's wrong and you can't wake yourself up. Right. And then all of a sudden she woke up and there was a big hand around her wrist and had her halfway out of her sleeping bag. Hmm. She slapped her husband really hard <laughs> and screamed and everybody woke up around the camp and that thing went running off, whatever, whoever, whatever it was. Hmm. Well, maybe it was curious. <laughs> yeah, that's what I was thinking. I don't know. I'm thinking like I'm curiosity skeptical. killed the saying. cat. <laughs> I, 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 I'm skeptical, you know, when you people tell these stories about mm-hmm. it. You know, I'm just, you know, it's my opinion. That's all it is. But yeah. I, I don't think that they really mean humans any harm. And again, they direct homo uh, or they view homo sapiens as their direct competition. Yeah. I mean, we are competing for the same niche. We're hominins. Anyways, that's my view. Now, there are those rare accounts of people running into them or things happening. But again, if you look at the body the of territorial evidence, thing, you mean? Yeah. I mean, yeah. And they, you've probably heard this before, but there are people that have claimed they've been chased by Bigfoot. Oh, yeah. And, yeah. And, I've got and, plenty of those. And, 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 email. And, and even though it's always the Bigfoot is always described as moving incredibly fast, much faster than I could move. They never catch anybody. They just chase you. In fact, I know of several accounts where people claim they were being chased by a Bigfoot. They ran out of breath and stopped, and the Bigfoot stopped. And then when they finally got their breath back and began to run, that's when the Bigfoot began to run again. So that would, mm-hmm. that would indicate a territorial charge. It's just trying to move you away from where it doesn't want you. Well, we get that with a lot of the Native Americans, their accounts, uh, what we can get at least <laughs> from Native Americans. Right. The mm-hmm. information that we can get a lot of the time has to do with any time, any time, any time, any time there was some sort of, you know, violent behavior or actions, it seemed to be because of territory. You know, like this is our hunting time. This is our gathering time. This is our area. This is, this is mm-hmm. ours. Yeah. You cross this magic line here and there's trouble. And that goes for any animal of any kind. Shoot, that goes for us. Yep, you want to cross our border, you're going to have to do it legally. <laughs> it's like, if you don't, we're going to ship you back. You're going to be in trouble. So I think it, I think for, you know, just for them as well, I, I think that, you know, as far as violent stuff, it's, it's usually due to crossing a line. You know? Yeah. Yeah. Those accounts. I mean, you have, there's like the famous ape Canyon incident where mm-hmm. the, the miners were attacked, but they had shot, two of these things right before that. So, yeah. Yeah. It was that day, wasn't it? Or that, that early evening, previous evening or something. Well, there's a researcher named Mark Marcel who's writing a book about Mm -hmm. it. He's been working on it for years, but um, 
they actually they shot the first one and then they actually went home for a, a few days for holidays and then they went back to the the area but yeah the day the night that they shot one that su uh, supposedly fell off a precipice into the canyon so they yeah. may have killed it uh that's when they were under siege so um that's really the you know the most dramatic story of an attack and it involves you know it was basically retaliation so oh wow that's interesting mm -hmm. hmm yeah, not to mention, I mean, they're probably up somewhere where it's just, you know, it's, it's, I mean, it's their, gosh, you're, you're wandering into the forest here, you know, and you don't know what's living in that section of the forest at that time. Yeah. You know, and I'm one of those guys, I don't know about you, you'll know this because, you know, you do a lot of research here, but I kind of believe that they do migrate, but not like from, you know, Mexico to Canada, but maybe from, you know, let's say here in the Pacific Northwest in Oregon, we've got the Cascades. We've got that kind of, you know, the, the, I guess you would say middle Cascades. And then we got the coastal range. Right. And maybe flowing down from winter time into the coastal range where the, actually the weather's a lot milder and then back up into the summertime into the higher Cascades just for food. Yeah. They have vast areas that they can forage and they, uh, they are generalist omnivores, I believe, just like bears. So they eat everything, you know, and they, they probably move to where the food is. And there are probably areas that they like. I'm with you. I think they, they either migrate or move around nomadically into areas that they, you know, they probably have a few different areas that they feed and, and move around. And that, that would, again, be an, an avoidance behavior, an adaptation to stay away yeah. from humans. You know, if, if they're moving around, they're harder to find. So, yeah. And so that, I mean, that's for me, that's why I think there was, you know, <clears throat> I, I, we found, I found, you know, mine happened both in one in July and the other was in, you know, December, you know, but it was in this, basically the same location you could say mm. within, you know, it, even if I was wrong on three miles away, it's gotta be within a five mile range of where we were before that. If yeah. that, you know, and that's, mm -hmm. that's pushing it for me. So you know, do some of them just stick to where they're at? Do some of them, you know, move from one area to another area? Um, you know, it's like Native Americans would move from one hunting ground to another hunting ground. Yeah. You know, from time to time. Absolutely. You go where the food is, you know. Yeah. So, yeah. So animals. Mm -hmm. awesome, man. <laughs> That's just awesome. I wish I had some more questions for you. How was the uh, Bigfoot and Brew? Bigfoot and Brew in Bend, Oregon this past weekend. It was a fantastic event. Uh, good crowd. Um, outstanding presentations. Uh, uh, my, not that mine was any good, but uh, Cliff Barrickman from Finding Bigfoot and uh, Mark Marcel, the gentleman who I just ex uh, mentioned, mm -hmm. the Eight Canyon expert, and Shelly Montana. Shane Corson. Yeah, we learned all about different aspects of the Pacific Northwest Bigfoot. And it sounds like it's, yeah. uh, they're going to do it again next year. And it's an event that's growing. So uh, any folks that are kind of in that eastern Oregon area, central eastern Oregon area, and they're, they're, there's a lot of activity out there as well, even though it's a lot of high desert and stuff. But um, there is. I've got a um, – it was about, I don't know, about a half a page report I got. Eh, about eight months ago that will come out this week, this Friday from the Chiloquin area. Mm. And it was, it actually has a story within a story. Um, the family had known about it since I guess the sixties when they moved out there and you know, um, they were native American though. So getting that kind of stuff is a rarity for me, but yeah, you know, yeah, that's nice. uh that's a good point. And that's something, if you know the history of Bigfoot and the, and the Sasquatch, particularly with the Sasquatch, which we first started hearing about in the 1920s uh, through a Canadian researcher named J.W. Burns. Mm -hmm. but he was a white man, but he, he worked as a, a teacher and an Indian agent uh, with, the, with the Chehalish people. And he, mm -hmm. basically, they just trusted him over time. They, and he began, that's how he began to sort of some of these safeguarded Sasquatch stories that the, that the Native people didn't want to share with outsiders. And he, he began to kind of glean those uh, and wrote about them. And so that, that's when we first started hearing about the Sasquatch was in the 1920s. Uh, of course, Bigfoot mm -hmm. didn't enter the scene till the fifties, but, um, 
So there's a long history there that a lot of people have lost sight of and forgotten about that we've known about these things for a long, long time. It's not something that just kind of popped up recently. Yeah. So. No, I like the history of it. Um, one of the first, uh, uh, well, of course, I've got all the John Green books and everything like that. But one of my other favorites was Notes from the Field with William. Oh, yeah. Mm -hmm. Jevning. And that was just, that was that was really good for, you know, at the very first few chapters, there is some good historical stuff about it um, with Native Americans, the names they had for it. And, and some of that, that was, that was pretty interesting, but I've always wondered why, <laughs> why they don't share more, you know, but yeah. then again, you know, to each his own, I suppose. Well, you know, that there, I would only be speculating, of course, so I don't want to, to disrespect those, those people, but I would say one thing is that there is a prevalent belief in cultures all over the world. When you're talking about Bigfoot type mm -hmm. creatures, relic hominids, such as the Yeti and the Yeren, Yawi. There are many native traditions where it's essentially it's bad luck to just talk about them. Yeah. And if you bring up the subject, you're likely to have some bad thing happen to you. And I never thought about that. So that, that could be part of it is that it's just bad juju and they just, you know, they, they know about them. They respect them. Um, but they, you know, they just, it's not a topic that's, that's typically brought up for fear of, uh, you know, sort of repercussions, if you will. You know, I never thought about it like that. I mean, I've heard that before. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> so that actually makes a whole lot of sense, you know, especially when they have, you know, things like, you know, we didn't look at them when we noticed they were around, we leave. Right. You know, so no wonder they to look, talk to about look into their much. eyes. You know, sometimes they'll say if you look in their eyes or. Um, yeah, yeah this, so. this guy called it uh, his his mother would call them um, like soul takers or something like that. Yeah. Just, so, yeah, 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 I've heard that. And uh, in Central America, I told you about the Sisamito down in Central mm -hmm. America, their Sasquatch. That name actually means shivers because when people see them, oh. they began to shake and, and tremble uncontrollably. So. They're, you know, they have all these, and you know, the, part of that may just be the fact that, of course, people are terrified when they run across them. We, you and I both know that. But um, also, they're seen so rarely that it's almost like uh, um, that could be interpreted by different cultures as kind of a, you know, a, an exceptional circumstance becomes an omen or a warning or a, or a harbinger of some bad mm -hmm. event you know sometimes cultures will interpret very rare things as kind of like bad luck um, once in a lifetime type of things so yeah well before we get going here ken would you like to share the the name of the book again and where we can find your new book yeah and uh thanks again so much david for having me on good conversation course, and uh really enjoyed it uh the new book is called the essential guide to bigfoot uh it's available on amazon.com uh, not yet in ebook form, just print form only. Um, eventually, there will be an ebook. Um, and if uh, if anyone wants a signed author's copy, they can just reach out to me on my uh, website, kengerhard.com, or through social media. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and uh, I'll be happy to 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 get them a signed copy as well. So. Awesome. And you know what, guys, um, I will have this. Uh, it's here on YouTube. If it's here right now, um, you guys can go down to the description down below and I will share all of those links with you. Uh, so you can just click on them and go right there and uh, um, get your copy and uh, request a signed copy. Let's see if we can get uh, get cans ha a hand in a in a cast. <laughs> we'll get him signing so many <laughs> he ends up with carpal tunnel that'll so, be that, that would go. actually be okay i'll i'll deal with that so real That's quick before i let you go ken any yeah. uh up and coming um um research expeditions um don't really uh have any expeditions planned until maybe november at the earliest but it's probably too mature to premature to to mention that but I do have some public appearances coming up. I, I imagine many of your listeners are there. Oh, yeah, in the share those Northwest. with us real quick. But um, this coming weekend, I'll be in Little Rock, Arkansas at the Arkansas Paranormal Expo. Um, next weekend, I'll be at the Toledo, Ohio Bigfoot and Paranormal Conference first year. Um, on the 19th, I'll be at the long-running Texas Bigfoot Conference in Jefferson, Texas, nice. very famous event. And then the following weekend, the 26th, we'll be gathering in 
just outside of Fort Worth, Texas to celebrate the 50th anniversary of something known as the Lake Worth Monster, which is a famous Bigfoot from Texas that was sighted oh, wow. uh, okay. about half a century ago. Yeah. So uh, lots of events coming up in the Texas, Arkansas, Ohio area. Awesome. Well, thank you so very much for being here, Ken. And hold on just one moment, okay? Sounds good. All right. And thank you guys so very much for being here on PacWest Bigfoot. Just to remind you guys, you want to get that essential guide, you guys just drop that description box down here. Just drop it down and you guys can click on there and order your copy today. And once again, God bless you guys. Thank you for being here and God bless. <laughs>